Hello my dear students, welcome to yet another interesting session on sound and noise. Today's session will introduce you to module 20 which deals with sound, its measurement, related terms and units. This is a part of the third unit in residential space designing. The interplay of light and sound in the environment is a constant feature and man's efforts to control them to suit his pursuit remains a sustained endeavor. It is clear that their interplay in the ambient atmosphere may not lend for control. Nevertheless, the interior of a building offers various opportunities for man to show his imagination and intelligence to create dramatic effects. To be successful, knowledge on the nature of the two factors is imperative. The previous sessions would have given an insight on light as a medium and introduced one of the concept of sound. This session covers sound as an exclusive parameter displaying its multifarious qualities an understanding of which is a requirement in the control of the factor. These aspects should be given fair priority in designing. What are the objectives? And what will you learn by the end of this session? Differentiate the types of waves. Identify the characteristics of sound waves for better comprehension of the concept. Know how sound characteristics are measured and the respective units. And gain knowledge on sound transmission and their behavioral aspects. Primary factor to be understood is on the concept of waves. As a prelude, we should have an understanding on the concept of waves. The mere thought of a wave reminds anyone primarily about the waves that are formed in the ocean, a body of flowing water, etc. People do not realize light and sound also travel in waves. Since they are invisible, the concept has to be understood to believe the fact. Again, one should not confuse sound waves with the type of waves that are formed in the ocean. As stated earlier, similarity between sound and light ends with the fact that they travel in waves because light waves travel as a different kind of wave. Light and water waves form transverse waves while sound waves travel only as longitudinal waves. The nature of wave formation caused by their shake in a specific direction differentiates the two kinds of waves. Come have a look at the figures. A wave shaking perpendicular to the movement direction is a transverse wave. Waves which move parallel to movement direction are longitudinal waves. This can be understood better by doing an experiment. Take a piece of rope, hold on either ends, stretch and shake it. You will be able to see wave formation in the transverse. Take a spring, hold on both ends and pull it. You will be able to see longitudinal wave formation. Now I believe you would have understood the difference between the two. Naturally, there are some points to ponder. The factors stated now have taught us that for forming sound waves, two aspects are absolutely necessary, a source and a medium. Vocal cord in the human throat is a part from which human voice originates. Vibrations from the vocal cords actually produce the voice. When a piper plays an organ pipe, sound is produced due to the vibrations of the air columns. It is but natural that you get the doubt how sound waves move in air. To learn about the method of wave movement in air, understanding a few terms related to sound propagation will be helpful. Important terms related to sound wave propagation are sine wave, sinusoidal wave, peaks, length, amplitude and frequency. The previous session would have thrown open some hints on these factors. Here are some additional technical explanations. First one is frequency spectrum of sounds. Initially, have an idea on frequency spectrum of sounds. Except basic sine waves, 
sounds are comprised of many different frequency components vibrating simultaneously. The unique frequency permutations it contains results in the particular characteristics of a sound. Let us have a look at the figures. The first one is a simple sinusoidal wave. The second one shows waves in different frequencies. Orange wave has the lowest frequency while pink has the highest. Sound waves are simply described as sinusoidal plane wave motions explained through their specific characteristics like wavelength, frequency and velocity. Wave motion in this context refers to the ability to transfer sound across an area. People also use symbols agreed upon by convention to label the characteristic quantities of the waves. Let us see each characteristic individually with their respective symbols. The first characteristic is wavelength. What is wavelength? Wavelengths denote the distance which is a characteristic of the particular wave. It indicates the distance travelled by the wave in one time period that is t second. The symbol is lambda measured in units of meters. The second characteristic is velocity. What is unique about it? Velocity measures the distance covered by sound in a second in a known direction in meters per second. In air, the increase is directly proportional to the increase in temperature or humidity. The third one is period. What does the term period mean here? It defines how long it takes for one wavelength to pass a fixed point. To be specific, it is the time required to complete one vibration. One could also turn this around and say how many waves go by in one second. The symbol used is T, the unit is seconds. The adjoining figure will make you understand the concept better. The next characteristic is frequency of sound. Scientifically speaking, frequency represents the pitch of a sound wave as high or low. It indicates just how often the waves occur during a particular period of time that is the number of vibrations made by the particle in one second. It is denoted by lowercase n. Frequency is equal to the velocity divided by the wavelength. The fifth characteristic is amplitude. What does it mean here? The maximum displacement of the particle on one side of its mean position is called the amplitude. Have a look at the figures to understand the meaning of these terms. Could you identify what each term means? Have you understood how each term differs from one another? So you also agree that each characteristic has a reason to differ. Good. Having come to know about the five characteristics, now see to the sixth one too. It is the wave shape. Whenever music, a note is played using a tuning fork, a sine wave, what you have seen as an undulating hilly pattern is shown by the oscilloscope. Closely view the next figure. The same note if played on a trumpet will show the wave to look more or less in a zigzag pattern usually called a sawtooth wave. On a flute it is shown as triangular waves and on a clarinet blown hard brings out waves showing square forms. Here the instrument pumps energy into the external world. The control practiced in pumping energy designs the shape of the waves. So each instrument produces different wave shapes. Have you known about this fact earlier? If the answer is no, I am happy to have taught you something today which is very interesting. To be specific, it relates to the way it can vibrate and in the process make the air within or outside it to vibrate in consonance. This is one of the major things that make instruments produce sounds that differ from one another. We are hearing a note with exactly the same frequency 440 hertz. Yet you can feel the difference. Hear this audio clip.
understand this better, you must know what is a frequency range or band. Don't you keep adjusting the frequency when you hear different music? What are you doing? Are you playing with the knob? Know for yourself. Frequency ranges or bands pertain to the energy contained in sound. Let us try to identify each kind of sound. I will explain the terms used to refer to sound and their corresponding meaning. When we say bass, it denotes sound containing a lot of low frequency energy. In mid range, sound is in the 250 to 4000 hertz frequency band. Human beings can hear best in this band. On the other hand, treble is when sound in high frequency energy goes beyond the mid range. It adds a crispness or brilliance to a sound. Now understand this graph. Do not confuse this with amplitude. Band speaks of energy contained in sound, but amplitude describes the energy the sound waves carry. Actually, amplitude is described as high if they carry larger amount and low if less. An integration of the energy of all the various pressures from peak to peak is known as sound energy measured in units of watts per square centimeter. Let us see where they are applied. Sound pressure is applied in research focusing on hearing, auditory research and sound and measurement in industry. Sound energy is used in research in acoustics. Awareness on resonance will help in better comprehension. What is resonance? Every object has a natural frequency at which they will vibrate when disturbed. Unless and until disturbed, many objects do not vibrate. For instance, a sound is created by a metal or wood when dropped down. In static position, they do not vibrate and therefore do not create sound. Resonance occurs when the natural frequency of an object coincides with the frequency of any vibrations applied to the object. These facts highlight the need to ponder upon some important aspects. Try to play the same musical note in two different instruments, perhaps in the same volume. They can sound completely different. How can that be if they are producing the same sound waves? It is quite obvious. They are not producing the same sound waves. Scientists use an oscilloscope to see the difference. Oscilloscope is an electronic graph drawing machine resembling a cathode ray television which basically can show pictures of how waves look like. Illustration you see on the screen shows the interior of a cathode ray tube for use in an oscilloscope. Naturally anybody will get a doubt. Do the graphs differ? Yes, they are different in their wave shapes. Everybody enjoys music. So the best way to explain the concept is by referring to the same to music. To follow the underlying aspects, we should have a know-how on how sound is measured. Human perception of sound seems to be logarithmic, a measure expressing a ratio between two sound pressures. The range of sound pressures which can be heard by the human ear is very great and it is convenient to express these differences in a logarithmic scale. The unit normally used is the bell which is a logarithm of a ratio of 10. But the most common and convenient measure of sound intensity is the decibel where the bell is divided into 10 parts. Therefore, a decibel is equal to 1 by 10th of a bell. So, let us see how sound intensity is measured from basic pressure. A pressure of 0.0002 dyne per square centimeter has been adopted as the basic pressure from which the decibel scale starts. This is roughly equivalent to the threshold of hearing at 1000 cycles per second. What is threshold of hearing? Threshold of hearing is equal to 1000 cycles per second and the pressure will be 0.0002 micro bar or dynes per square centimeter. What do you understand from this? An increase therefore of 10 dB is equivalent to a tenfold increase in sound energy which is supposed to give a subjective impression of approximately doubling the loudness of sound. 
From this, how do you estimate sound in intensity at different levels? At 40 dB, that is sound level in a room, in a private residence, the sound energy would be increased 10,000 fold while the pressure will remain at 0 0.02 dynes per square centimeter. But at 70 dB, which is about the level to be found in a typing area, the sound pressure will be 0 0.63 dynes per centimeter square and the sound energy would have further increased 1000 fold. To measure these, we need instruments. Measurement of the intensity of sound is generally made in industry by means of a sound level meter. The picture illustrates a sound level meter being used for the purpose in an area. Now let us have a look at the sound intensity from various sources. Have a look at the table. Now we would have understood that the voice level in which you speak, noises in the workplace, sounds in the road all differ in their sound intensity. How often are you exposed to such sounds? To understand this well, we should know how sound is transmitted and how it may also incur losses. Transmission of sound considers sound energy transmitted through the walls and the other barriers. Let me explain this process. When sound is produced in a room, it traverses outside as waves of spherical pattern and strike the boundaries of the room. Such waves undergo reflection, absorption and transmission in varying amounts. The frequency of sound and the characteristics of the walls of the room that is the wall thickness, weight, material used, nature of the surface etc. decide the amounts of the three processes. The concern here is whether it can be continuous. Can there be losses? Yes. There is every possibility to incur losses in enclosed buildings, especially houses with different rooms. And what is transmission loss? A wall or any other barrier will cause loss of sound energy which is defined as transmission loss. Whenever sound is transmitted from a source to an adjoining area or room, such hindrances can entail reduction in sound energy causing the phenomenon of transmission in loss. By measuring the sound levels on either sides of a wall, transmission loss can be calculated. For instance, if the sound levels in the interior and exterior of a wall of a room are 48 dB and 8 dB respectively, then transmission loss of the wall will be 40 dB. Please try a self-check exercise. Find out the transmission losses that occur in the various rooms in your house. Compare losses that incur with load bearing and partition walls and various materials used for construction which may again show differences. This leaves us with some points to ponder in application. When designing an interior, these major aspects have to be borne in mind. Transmission losses can be varied depending on the sound insulation required in the room. Larger the loss, greater the sound insulation. Materials used for construction. Losses vary with building materials used. Methods of construction adopted. Values for losses tend to differ with methods used. Frequency of the sound produced, etc. It is evident therefore that sound transmission has an influence on the behavior of sound in an interior. How does sound behave in an enclosed space? As stated in the previous session, sound from the outside cannot be controlled but sound produced in an enclosed space can be controlled. For this, one needs to know how sounds behave in an interior. Terms related to this concept can be broadly delineated as sound reflection, echo and reverberation. Let us see what they mean. The first one is sound reflection. When sound is reflected, it obeys the law of reflection of all waves. That is, the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. The angle here per se is measured between the path of the sound wave and the reflector. The angle of reflection differs with the surfaces of reflection. On parallel smooth surfaces, sound moves, waves move as they do from the source of sound. See the figure. Convex surfaces disperse the waves. They tend to scatter sound energy and cause diffusion of sound. See the next one. Concave surfaces 
concentrate sound waves in a certain areas. Hence, they are not recommended for places where people assemble to hear something like a church sermon or an orchestra. See the third one. Second point is echo. An echo is defined as a long delayed reflection, a sound that is reflected and heard for more than 0.1 seconds succeeding the actual one. This happens whenever a sound wave when reflected reaches the oral processes and almost simultaneously within a time interval of about 1 by 7th of a second another sound wave follows it as a repetition. A delayed but stronger reflection causes echoes to blur and confuse the original sound because the sound arriving first will be louder. So the definition needs to be revisited for fine tuning. Subsequent reception of a direct sound if a strong reflection is received that is by, a, by 1 by 20th of a second interval echoes occur. Know a little more on echo and a related aspect called echelon effect. Echo also occurs when the shape of the reflected surface is curved and smooth. To overcome echoes, designing proper room shapes its surfaces and use of suitable resilient materials in the interior is suggested. Covering the long distance walls and high ceilings with absorbent materials can be helpful. Echelon effect. Provision of a set of metal railings and regular spacing of reflected surfaces are responsible for this effect where they tend to produce a musical note due to regular succession of echoes of sounds. This further adds to the confusion in hearing and effective audibility. You need to buffer this effect too. Third one is reverberation. And what is this? Sounds produced in a building tend to stay after it is produced and reaches the listener many times. To be specific, the first will be directly from the source followed by those reflected from the internal building components namely walls, ceiling and floor of the interior. What the listener receives a series of sounds of diminishing intensity. Part of the energy is lost at every step of reflection, an important point to remember in space designing. Such prolonged reflection of sound from the walls, floor and ceiling of the room is referred to as reverberation. A look at the figure will help you understand better. When sound is produced in an enclosed space, it continues to be heard until all the energy imparted to the original sound waves has been expanded. The reflected waves travel in all directions in the room losing a certain amount of energy at each reflection until the sound dies away. If the room is carpeted and is finished well with furnishings, these soft fabrics will absorb sound energy quickly and thereby muffle the sound spontaneously. In an empty room, especially the reflections and subsequent reverberation are found to sustain longer. What is reverberation time? It is the duration for which the sound persists. It is explained as the duration taken for the sound to record below the minimum audibility measured for the instant when the sound ended sounding. This is defined as the duration for a sound to die by 60 dB from its actual level. It depends upon the distance between the surfaces of the room, the absorption of those surfaces and the frequency of the sound. The optimum reverberation time depends on the volume of the room, size of the hall, loudness of the sound, the kind of music and the types of sound for which the hall was built. W. C. Sabine, professor of physics, Harvard University, had done extensive research on the topic. Sabine's formula is used to help in estimation. What is Sabine's formula? Sabine's formula has been found to give reasonable predictions of reverberation time for rooms without excessive absorption. The formula uses the details on the surface areas of the room and their absorption characteristics to predict the reverberation time for those conditions. So RT is equal to 0 0.16 V by A where RT is equal to reverberation time V indicates the volume of the room in cubic meters and A is the total absorption of room surface in meter square sardines. So sum total of each area multiplied by absorption coefficient of that area will give you the answer. Now have a look at the recommended values 
of a reverberation time. The maximum time permissible in the given frequency that is where human beings show appreciable audibility itself is only 1.4 seconds. All these factors have to be considered in designing space. Certain factors inherent to those discussed above can affect one's hearing. Let us have a look at those factors too. Factors affecting efficiency in hearing in an interior are reverberation, loudness, focusing surfaces, resonance and noise. Let us have a look at the impacts of each factor and the possible measures to manage defects. First one is reverberation. Loss of clarity results when reverberation is large. The opposite causes inadequacy in loudness. How can we control? What can we do? Provide functional fenestrations that is windows and ventilators made to facilitate opening and closing to help maintain optimum reverberation time. Decorate your walls with hangings for sound absorption. Hang heavy draperies and curtains. Cover walls with absorption material liners. Ensure full capacity of audience in theatres and conference halls. Use floor coverings, especially carpets or accent rugs. The second factor is loudness. How does it affect us? Both sound frequency and the wave's amplitude decide the loudness. Human beings do not exhibit equal sensitiveness in hearing at all frequencies. In the frequency range between 2 kHz and 5 kHz, an individual's ear is most sensitive but least sensitive at low or at extremely high frequencies. Provisions made for great absorption to manage reverberation time may at times affect the intelligibility of hearing. To ensure satisfactory hearing, sufficient loudness across the entire room is a must. In such cases, attempts to increase loudness can be made. How can you achieve that? While constructing, one can opt for low ceilings in rooms, Providing false ceiling at a lower height in spaces where many people assemble can be helpful especially when one needs to reflect sound energy towards the audience. In theatres and auditoriums and home theatres, other cosmetic corrections can also be tried like using large sounding boards behind the speaker and facing the audience, keeping large polished reflectors exactly above the speakers or using amplifiers to provide additional sound energy. The third factor is focusing surfaces. During construction of buildings and designing individual spaces, designers generally make two mistakes. The first mistake is they are found to introduce focusing surfaces like a concave, spherical, cylindrical or parabolic feature in the walls and or ceilings in buildings, especially in the interiors. It can be a curved wall, a domed ceiling or a cylindrical structure around a spiral staircase. Whatever may that be, their introduction produces concentration of sound into particular regions while in some other part of the room no sound reaches at all, creating islands of silence or poor audibility. Because of this, the major aim in sound transmission that is uniform distribution of sound in the room is lost. The second mistake is providing extensive reflecting surfaces in the room. When sound waves strike them, the reflected and the direct sound waves together tend to form stationary wave system resulting in bad and uneven sound intensity distribution system. This jeopardizes the entire aim of providing uniform distribution of sound energy in a room. Designers have to adopt a few methods to curtail these conditions. What methods can you adopt? Avoid curved surfaces in construction. Cover curved surfaces if at all provided with absorbent materials. Provide low ceiling, a parabolical surface if at all provided in large halls can be converted into a reflecting surface by arranging the speaker at the focus. This will ensure sending a uniform reflected beam of sound in the hall. Fourth one is the resonance. In some buildings, window panes, less rigid walls, sections of wooden parts like a shutter are prone to vibration and they create peculiar sounds. Depending upon the material, sound waves can either be reflected that is bounced off, absorbed or diffused as you can see in the figure, rendering a total loss of sound effect you intend to create. 
If frequencies are similar to other audio frequencies in the room, this will result in resonance. A major cause of resonance in an interior is enclosed air. Suitable dampers have to be used to contain such occurrences. The fifth aspect is noise. This is the most important one to be avoided. Noise produced from the exterior or produced within the room or building has a great impact on people and their actions. Being defined as unwanted sound, it can be jarring or displeasing to the inmates. There is something called as extraneous noise. Three types of noises have been identified as extraneous noise. What are they? They are airborne noise, structure borne noise and inside noise. Extraneous noise has been identified and proved to be troublesome for listeners. They have to be controlled in interiors. What can we do to avoid them? Adopt sound insulation and soundproofing. Sound insulation or soundproofing refers to the methods adopted to prevent their transmission, the type of which differs and depends upon the type of noise to be treated. This se session, dear students, was meant to instill in your minds certain concepts related to sound and noise and their interplay in designing comfortable interiors, affording a peaceful ambience. I conclude with a note that knowledge on the terms related to sound will help you in comprehending them and identifying the basic differences. In the process, it will also dispel ambiguity found with terms say sound energy and sound pressure which are generally misconstrued. Awareness on these aspects will prove beneficial in designing acoustically perfect interiors. We will meet again in the next section on sound and noise in a different dimension called acoustics.